you guys welcome to week eight we're only covering two chapters this week which is awesome because that gives you guys some time to get caught up on whatever you need to and this week we'll be talking about um, antibiotics um, antifungals everything to do with infectious disease so let's start off with our um, bacteria bacteria are single celled organisms that are found everywhere on our skin in our mouth in our GI tract just about everywhere um, bacteria that cause disease are pathogenic and bacteria that do not cause disease are non-pathogenic. Something you might hear referred to um, when physicians are talking about bacteria and infections is what is the pathology, meaning which bacteria caused the infection, which pathogenic bacteria specifically. Bacteria do not exist internally, which means they aren't in our spaces that aren't exposed to the outside world. So when I said they're in our GI tract, our GI tract is essentially just a hollow tube that goes from our mouth all the way down to our anus. Um, so they are found in our GI tract. Technically, that's not internal. Um, they aren't found in spaces like our brain or in spaces um, such as the spinal cord. They're not found within our heart, typically, unless we have an infection. So um, moving on from that idea, um, the morphology of bacteria, which is in the um, PowerPoint on slide six. They can exist in pairs, and those are called diplococci. They can exist in clusters or chains. Um, bacilli can exist in straight little single celled or single um, sort of bacilli, or they can be short or curved. Um, spirillium, which are the twisted ones, can be um, there's a couple different options there, Borrelia, Spirillia, um, and Treponema. Um, most often, you find the bacilli or cocci. Those are your most common bacteria. So how do we de differentiate between the different types? Um, we can stain them with gram stains. It will either turn out blue or red. Crystal is blue. Crystal violet is blue. Saffronin is red. Gram positive bacteria remain blue, and gram negative bacteria remain red. Um, so the only difference between these two types of bacteria is a cell wall, and we'll get into that a little later. Let me just go down on this one. Location. So chemotherapy um, can be used to talk about um, antibiotic therapy. Um, usually you don't hear antibiotic therapy referred to as chemotherapy, though I like to use chemotherapy when we're talking about cancer treatment. So we'll stay away from that term here. But chemotherapy, per the book, is the use of drugs to kill or stop the growth of cancerous cells or infectious organisms. If it's bactericidal, it kills the bacteria. If it's bacteriostatic, it inhibits the reproduction of bacteria. So where do we get our chemotherapy or antibiotics from? Um, it can come from soil microorganisms or chemical synthesis. Um, and these chemical substances obtained from microorganisms and used in antibiotic therapy are referred to as antibiotics. So the mold penicillin um, produces a substance that inhibits the growth of many gram-positive pathogenic bacteria. This substance, known as penicillin, is the parent compound of some of the most widely used antibiotic drugs. So that's an example of an antibiotic that came from a soil organism. Antibacterial drugs that are developed by chemical synthesis are referred to as antimicrobials. However, you will, you will hear these terms interchanged. Um, a lot of times people will just strictly say antimicrobial or antibacterial, and they're not referring to the source of it. They're just using a term that they're comfortable with. So the antibacterial spectrum is the spectrum of bacteria susceptible to an antibiotic. A broad spectrum antibiotic is an antibiotic that has an action against a wide range of bacteria. And bacterial resistance is the ability of bacteria to resist the effects of antibiotic, usually through mutation or change in the bacteria itself that allows it to be uh, stronger and more resistant to our antibiotics. And this is a big problem coming up um, in the world today. So. How do they become resistant? Um, one way is through beta-lactamase enzymes, and these are enzymes that are secreted by bacteria that break down certain antibiotics. Um, so, <laughs> beta-lactamases that inactivate cephalosporins are known as cephalosporinases. Um, 
and beta-lactamases that inactivate penicillins are known as penicillinases. Chemoprophylaxis refers to the use of antibiotics to, before bacterial infection has developed in order to prevent infection. Certain individuals should receive chemoprophylaxis before treatments that they undergo. Um, and that includes um, maybe before dental, respiratory, urinary, or other invasive medical procedures. In addition, individuals exposed to patients with tuberculosis, meningitis, and other in contagious infections may also be given chemoprophylaxis. So let's go on to penicillin. Penicillin is an antibiotic obtained from various species of penicillin mold. Alteration of the basic structure and addition of various salts have provided numerous, numerous penicillin preparations. So the term beta-lactam is used to classify penicillin, cephalosporin, carbapenem, and monobactam antibiotics. They all contain a four-sided chemical ring, which is that beta-lactam ring. So when we talk about beta-lactamases, which is the enzyme secreted by bacteria to break down the antibiotic, that enzyme is attacking that four-structured, four-sided ring. So first generation um, of penicillins include penicillin G and penicillin V. They were narrow spectrum, meaning not effective against a ton of different anti or bacteria. They were effective against gram-positive bacteria, specifically streptococci. Sorry, I don't know why I keep yawning. Um, they were not effective against gram-negative bacilli, um, which were rods or organisms that produced penicillinase. Um, second generation penicillins included ampicillin and amoxicillin. Um, they had an extended spectrum. They were effective against the same bacteria as first generation, as well as some gram negatives, including E. coli and Haemophilus influenza. However, combinations of um, second generation penicillins with drugs known as beta lactamase inhibitors um, allowed them to overcome sort of that resistance that had begun to develop to penicillins. Third generation penicillins included carbenicillin and ticarcillin. Even broader spectrum than second generation now had um, activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Pseudomonas vulgaris. I'm sorry, Proteus vulgaris. Um, fourth generation, even wider spectrum, um, the broadest of the class, included piperacillin, which is in real life combined with um, tazobactam. So you have your penicillin and your lactamase inhibitor, which makes that a super strong drug, which was able to overcome resistance that has popped up recently. Um, let's see, moving on to beta-lactamase inhibitors. Sometimes we see two drug names, such as I just mentioned, um, piperacillin and tazobactam, or in the case of augmentin, the generic being amoxy amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. And again, what that does is that second part of the name is a beta-lactamase inhibitor, and it stops the enzyme activity of the bacteria to allow the original drug to work more effectively. Adverse effects of penicillins include nausea, diarrhea, um, allergies such as anaphylaxis. Usually we can control that nausea and diarrhea by either giving it with a meal or um, sometimes patients might take a yogurt with live cultures and eat that around the same time they're taking the antibiotic. Carbapenems and monobactams. Carbapenems, um, they're both structure, structurally similar to penicillins. Carbapenems have a broad spectrum as well as increased resistance to beta-lactamases. Monobactams are highly resistant to penicillinase and effective against gram-negative bacteria. So, as trianam is classified as a monobactam, it is administered intravenously for resistant gram-negative infections and is not active against gram-positive or anaerobic organisms. Just an example of a medication there. On slide 19, we go into all of the ones we just talked about, first, second, third, and fourth generation, as well as carbapenems and monobactams. So that covers that class. Um, moving on to cephalosporins. Um, very similar to penicillins, um, however, they are bactericidal, they disrupt cell wall synthesis, and they are classified by their spectrum into four separate groups. 
They are substituted for penicillins whenever allergy or resistance is suspected. First generation, cephalexin and cefazolin, two of our most commonly used antibiotics in treatment or in practice. They're used to treat gram-positive and negative infections, especially Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, on this group, so second generation includes cefaclor and cefoxetin. They're broader spectrum than first generation and indicated when first generation is not effective. There's some specific bacteria that they are used to treat that you can take a look at there. They are considered more potent, and you're going to see that with these classes. As we go up in class, they are more potent. Third generation, cefixime, ceftonir, and ceftriaxone. Broader spectrum than even the second. Longer duration of action. And they're used to treat serious gram-negative infections. They do cross the blood-brain barrier, so they can be used to treat meningitis. Um, do, 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 do. Since they have a longer half-life, they also can be dosed once a day if needed. Sometimes twice a day on a couple of those. Um, let's see. Fourth generation includes cefepime, and it has been classified um, as greater resistance to beta-lactamases. Um, it is indicated when the lower generations are ineffective. Adverse effects of cephalosporins include GI disturbances, uh, kidney toxicity, disulfiram reaction with alcohol, which is where if somebody drinks at the same time as taking these medications, they will get extremely violently ill. Allergy is lower than that of penicillin. Um, however, it's usually not administered because there is a cross-reaction, cross-sensitivity. It's usually not administered to a patient who has had an anaphylactic reaction or hives with penicillin. So, um, on slide 24, it goes through all of the classes we just talked about within cephalosporins. Moving on to aminoglycosides, and this will be the last one we cover in this video before we move on to a second video because this chapter is pretty long. Aminoglycosides are effective against gram-negative bacilli, not effective against anaerobic organisms. They are bacteriostatic, which means they just don't halt the uh, bacteria in its tracks. They don't necessarily kill it and it causes inhibition of protein synthesis. They are poorly absorbed in the GI tract, which makes them good for abdominal surgery if we're giving it orally. Um, for systemic treatment, injection is required. Um, large doses may be given orally before abdominal surgery as prophylaxis to reduce the number of intestinal bacteria and sterilize the bowel. Um, let's see, adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea when taken orally. Neph nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity when injected, meaning toxic to the ears, can cause ringing in the ears and permanent ear damage, as well as toxic to the kidneys. Cautions and contraindications should not be given during pregnancy, um, should not be given with general anesthetics because it can lead to muscular blockage that can cause permanent paralysis. A note on the pregnancy thing, they will give it right before the baby is born if needed. It's no longer an issue at that point. So this is covered on slide 27. Every All of the drugs that are in this class, you might hear genomycin, amikacin, canamycin, neomycin, streptomycin, and tobramycin. Um, those are all drugs that are included in the aminoglycoside um, class.